So I'm going to follow Lynn's dictates and say we start on time and end on time. So we're here um, here to hear uh, a talk by Dr. Pierre. Yeah, I we practice this, and I'm still getting it wrong. Gertrude Platz, excellent. Uh, whom the Russians call Artyom, which is much easier for me. He's a professor, assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History, Cultural History, at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. His discipline of training is anthropology, but his research focus uh, is on cultural heritage politics, which includes the nexus between archaeology, diplomacy, bureaucracy, and technology. Um, he's written on heritage statecraft, post-conflict heritage politics, and he'll speak about this on Thursday evening at the GISB, at the International Studies Lecture Hall at 7 o'clock. Um, and the title of that talk is? Violence and Travels for Palmyra. <laughs> so it's a lovely and intriguing kind of talk about, um, about uh, preservation as diplomacy. Um, <clears throat> and he writes about the intersection of the nation state and archaeology. I met Gretchen at a conference in Helsinki last summer and I was really struck by how much of his work had to do with the history and the topics of the workshop. And, um, and some things that I've been thinking a lot about uh, that Lynn also worked on about the, uh, <coughs> the origins and transformations of norms, dialogues around norms that enable collective action to occur, uh, the notions of polycentrism, within a multi-federal ethnic state and non-state solutions to uh, local and regional uh, problems. So I was really excited to bring him here to, to talk about his work. So he will speak for a few minutes about uh, this paper that we've all had a good chance to look at. Um, and then we'll open up for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regina. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a great honor to be uh, invited here. It also feels a little bit like I'm reliving my public defense of my PhD uh, thesis that was well, not that long ago. Usually when you're uh, invited for a, a talk, you give a talk of 30 minutes, you prepare it on the, air, on the airplane, and then you try to give a, do a good job. Now, I, during the Christmas holiday, I had to write a 30-page paper, and I first started writing a completely other paper because I was so intrigued and so uh, inspired by the work of Regina and many others at this university. But I ended up writing an entirely different paper, and then Regina, Regina kindly um, asked me to get back to my old topic. So in two or three days, I uh, wrote a new paper. And the great thing is that now I have uh, two... It's, it happens other places too, you guys. <laughs> and um, now the great thing is that now I have two papers that uh, I need to polish up, but uh, two papers that uh, I can uh, potentially submit for, um, for publication. So uh, first, uh, I would like to give a little bit of context uh, on what my paper will, why I decided to share a paper that deals with the role of culture and heritage uh, in corporate social responsibility strategies of um, of um, uh, multinational oil and gas corporations, but also I want to frame a little bit uh, within the discussion. Um, I'm kind of endlessly um, critiquing neoliberalism. Um, and uh, sharing my frustration with the uh, neoliberalism. And that, that comes, um, um, there's more or less three reasons uh, why I wrote the paper and tackled the paper like it is now. Uh, first of all, in the beginning of, of, of this academic year at Utrecht, I'm teaching there, we have a research master that is a preparation uh, for uh, students that are doing a PhD. And um, I was teaching a course, uh, every week they had to read one book that dealt with how norms are created, how subjects are created, how epistemologies are created by states and private players. And we, I called it the, 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 the course introduction into subject craft, not state craft, but how states craft subjects. We were reading Agamben, Foucault, and I always wanted to explore a little bit more in depth how um, um, subjects are being crafted in Russia, because we tend to look at Russia through the lens of Putin, and the real male uh, in my kind of a field that I'm interested in, cultural heritage politics, goes and dives in the Black Sea and magically discovers amphora and, and, and nice finds. Uh, but um, I really wanted to, to look a little bit more into how, how the Russian citizens are, are being created, because that's something that we sometimes uh, neglect too much, uh, especially where I work in Siberia, because usually a lot of uh, 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 
uh, things on, on the culture and politics of Russia are, again, uh, especially uh, analyzed through the lens of Moscow and St. Petersburg. A second thing, reason why I wanted to write this paper uh, is, um, has to do with um, uh, the university that I work now. I, I previously uh, worked at an American uh, university in California, and um, I w was kind of <coughs> struck um, by um, some things that have happened in the beginning of this year of, of the university where I, now, where I work now. As you all know, in Europe, there's now the austerity politics are still ongoing, uh, budget cuts are still ongoing, and we have to uh, find money from outside the university because basically we have no money anymore. And as an anthropologist, as a young anthropologist and a young researcher, uh, the, the only money that is, is available to uh, and the big grants, uh, the grants that are available at, at, in Europe these days are big grants. Two, three million dollar euro grants uh, for a young assistant professor that uh, barely uh, uh, is now finishing his first monograph and doesn't want to uh, supervise five PhD students and a postdoc. Um, there's not, there's not a lot of small money. I'm an anthropologist. I just need a couple of 10,000 euros to go to, to, to Russia, Georgia, lose myself there for a couple of months, and then go back and write everything up. So um, my, my dean, the, faculty, the, the head of departments, suggested uh, that all the assistant professors try to look for corporate funding for their research. And um, my um, department, uh, the head of the department, also hired me, so I, I, I'm Always, I think he didn't really read and understand my research. He suggested to me that I would write the corporate history of Shell, who, because I was doing something with corporate uh, energy companies, the cultural heritage. So maybe I could work either write a corporate history of Shell, or I could uh, help them in, um, in in consulting and dealing with those very difficult indigenous people that they're constantly. Uh, Encountering. So that's the second reason why I'm, the paper is, it was written and, 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 and it really deals with the liberalization of, of, of universities. Uh, it's very much interwoven into, um, into the argument that I bring. And the third reason why I, I wanted to write this paper has to do with this picture. Um, at, uh, in Utrecht, I'm uh, coordinating a master in cultural history and in cultural heritage studies. And uh, one of my students, uh, all our students need to do an internship. Uh, again, some kind of a sign of neoliberalism that we have to prepare our students for the, the labor market. Um, but one of my students works for the national, a national funded um, folklore museum in Arnhem, uh, and near Amsterdam, not, uh, not near Amsterdam, an hour drive from Amsterdam, between Amsterdam and the German border. And uh, that student uh, needed to uh, develop an exhibition for uh, this pumper, this pump, uh, pump, pump jack, I need to need to look up the, the word in English, a pump jack, and that pump jack is now part of the Folklore Museum in the Netherlands, and it was don donated by the Dutch oil company. There's a lot of gas and oil in the north of, of, the, of, of, of the Netherlands, and my student was forced, because the museum is n now has n no money anymore, because there's this austerity politics in the Netherlands, uh, the museum is now partially being funded by the Dutch oil company, and uh, the Dutch oil company is a joint venture between ExxonMobil and Shell. And um, they needed to, uh, the, the, the museum is some kind of a park museum, and it has a lot of old buildings, old windmills, it's the Netherlands, windmills and tulips are everywhere. <laughs> People are wearing, wearing these wooden shoes, clumps. Uh, and there's also now a pump jack. And the discourse around that, that my students had to create for this pump jack was that this pump jack enabled uh, the Netherlands uh, to grow vegetables and greenhouses, it enabled progress, and it was also a sign of modernity, of, uh, of after the Second World War, pump jack, and now they're fracking in the north of, uh, of so they're also fracking a lot in, in, in Europe these days. Um, so uh, my student was kind of, my students were kind of being asked to write narratives, produce narratives that were really geared at, at, at bringing, first of all, oil infrastructure into some kind of a positive, giving it a positive connotation. They're also being asked to, um, um, uh, to basically uh, work for a corporation. And, and, and in anthropology and in archaeology and in cultural heritage politics, we often um, ask our students to be critical of the nation state and the politics of the past. But um, a real ethical toolkit of dealing with corporate social responsibility programs uh, is not really uh, there. Um, uh, and uh, is there, but is not that elaborate. And I think this. Um, ethical toolkit is also very relevant for my department, uh, the head of department that asked me to write my corporate history of, of Shell to 
Um, as a historian, he's very knowledgeable about the impact of a nation state in the 19th century on the discipline of history, but not really of corporations and how they uh, shape um, uh, um, uh, historical discourse. So um, what I'm going to talk, the paper uh, really um, I went back to my ethnographic uh, notes, went back to a paper that I've written previously in 2014. I really wanted to focus, first of all, on how subjects are being crafted through this cooperation. Secondly, how, in a way, it's interwoven in my arguments, how we as academics are often an important stakeholder in producing these subjectivities, regimes of truth. And in my paper, I write about how the Russian Academy of Science is one of the many players that helps normalizing the agenda of, of Gazprom and, and also, uh, basically, uh, the Kremlin. Uh, and um, so, um, three things that I really wanted to, to, to explore in this paper are, first of all, corporate social responsibility, but the impact on the ground. How, is, how, how are these initiatives, these corporate responsibility initiatives, being reproduced by the people, perceived by the people, and how do they change uh, the fabric of a society? The second thing that I wanted to explore is uh, really a cultural policy in electoral authoritarian regimes. We often look to uh, these uh, states like Russia, China, uh, as states where there's not a lot of, uh, where this, the central state really defines almost anything and every part of the of the state. But what we see is an Iowa Wong, Iowa Wong from um, uh, an anthropologist that wrote a lot about uh, special economic zones, and I think in Southeast Asia, really writes about how these big authoritarian states actually allow a lot of exceptions because they want to strategically tap into the potential of the market. So, for example, in, in China, and I think it's in Shanghai, you're allowed to use Facebook. While in other parts of China, I worked a little bit in, in Xinjiang and uh, not far from Urumqi also, and um, there you're not allowed to do anything at all. So, these images that we often use in analyzing Russia are often very much top-down, almost the big Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes, the central state defines everything, and everybody ag agrees to the same kind of rule of law. But what you actually see in, in, in Russia, too, is that there's a lot of exceptions now. So that's <coughs> the second thing that I wanted, wanted to explore, cultural policy. <coughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the third thing that I wanted to do is contribute to uh, asymmetric federalism in Russia. So that more or less summarizes the context of this paper, I've been talking too long, I'm very sorry. So I leave it up to uh, you now. I'm very grateful that uh, you guys are all here. Usually when I give a talk, there's only uh, two people uh, in, in the room. So uh, feel free to, I don't know really how it's now going to go. So I leave it up um, to you. I'll take people's hands uh, since we've all read the paper and call on them and we'll, um, we'll start. So is there someone who, because I would love <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm going to kick it off, and I'm going to kick it off by asking you to, to um, I'll, I'll just put it on the table, that uh, to talk a little bit about how long Gazprom has been playing this role and whether it's Gazprom playing this role or the state working through Gazprom or whether that's changed. And you understand the context yeah. of the question perfectly because we now see oil companies being tasked to do things such as public opinion polls ahead of elections in order to gauge opinion on behalf of the regime. So I wondered how much of this um, uh, is coming from the central state as a directive and how much of this is really corporate. So I'll leave that question there and I, I, I will take a few. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, yeah. So I guess my question um, had two parts. I really, really enjoyed this a little bit about corporate social responsibility, but a less norm-centric and more sort of goods, collective goods-centric kind of way. And so one of the questions that I had is, um, you kind of write that Gazprom was really quite successful in their strategy, um, and, and I, I would expect there's quite a bit of variance here in other contexts. And so I'm curious if you could say a little bit about why it was so successful. You sort of detail the ways in which they sort of change norms or sort of what the reasonable implications are of that. But I'm just curious as sort of what you think made them so successful at doing so. And the other question that I had had to do with agency on the part of the local community. So your story is really fascinating from a sort of thinking about, um, honestly, a elite perspective, right? You've got the Academy of Health and Sciences, and you've got Gazprom, and you've got 
state, right? But I was curious about what kind of agency you see people as having in terms of receiving or in as sort of thinking through the changes of these norms and the perspectives around gas bomb and its and its efforts. So I'll let you those are two big questions. Yeah. Um, um, I'll, 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 I'll do uh, yours first, Rina, uh, before I forget it. Um, so th that's, always, that has, that's also something that I indicated in my conclusion. I really um, um, want to read up more about the history of, of, of the oil, comp of, of oil in, 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 in Russia and in the Soviet state. I read a little bit that Gustafsson has a, an enormous book about that. He kind of hints at that um, Gas and oil company was not that was focused on at the international market, but not like it is today. And what I find interesting to see now in Russian politics today, and I could be mistaken, is that the people that are in power, the Putin and the Donbas Klatura, are Gazprom people. They're shareholders. The, all the and 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 in, in Russia, there's the habit of that a lot of people have a dacha, or some kind of a summer house in the mountains, and all the people that have of Moscow that have a dacha in in, in, Gaz, in, in, in Altai today is the dacha is <coughs> being built by Gazprom and it's all people that are in the new that are in the government it's ministers it's it's presidents so it's a little bit a big question who was first the chicken or the egg because I think um, um, the model that I kind of see in this case study is that um, it's not the government that defines what Gazprom must do, but it's an elite that has a lot to win with Gazprom that is in power and is defining the rules of the game. So that's that's the it's it's a, it's a difficult one. That's why I think I said something. Okay, Gazprom is a parastatal organization, but the state is some kind of a para corporate yeah. entity. They're very much interwoven. They're very much interlinked. So it's very diff that's something that I, I definitely want to read up more because there's there's a history of that. But the, I think it's. The, um, and one of the books of Vladimir Gelman, he, Gelman writes about this whole uh, Medvedev, Putin, that are very much owners of Gazprom. They own a, they a lot of shares, so in a way, they're not they're not that different. So they're very much in the room. Can I go to? The, yeah, sure. So uh, thank you. Uh, and um, there's a, a problem with anthropologists that Sherry Ortner uh, wrote about recently is that. Um, there's an obsession with what, what they call dark anthropology. Is that we're all obsessed with looking for exam. I think we're all looking for conf 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 confirmation of Foucault's governmentality theory. Is that we're all shaped, and everything is all people are always completely shaped. So I think that there's anyway a bias in that research. The paper that I anticipated to write, uh, that, that I wrote during the, the, the Christmas holiday, tried to tease out more and more, also a little bit more the resistance, but also the vernacularization how people internalize these discourses and translate them to their own norms. So that's, that's, kind, that's kind, of, kind of interesting. So, um, so for your first question, question, why is Gazprom so success, successful? I think it is um, um, because they use culture. And um, they really solved, and I have actually a picture uh, I won't show it for them. So they basically repatriated this mummy. It's, 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 it's the Siberian Etsy. So I, and, um, I'll put it back again because not a lot of people are always happy uh, that I uh, show this. Uh, so they, 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 um, it's very, it's, it's, they, they solved a very sensitive question. And also the thing is, in contexts like the Altai Republic, um, um, they managed the entire political ecosystem as being managed. So um, school, uh, the, cult uh, the cultural houses are being renovated. There are schools that all of a sudden get um, uh, swimming pools. Uh, there are sport clubs that are being uh, uh, sponsored. Uh, everybody is going to this, um, this museum. So I think it's, it's really uh, their multifaceted approach uh, and multifaceted communication has, has a big impact. Then to draw attention to the, the agency, of course there's um, to a certain extent, resistance. There is a resistance. And um, in 2015, during the last year, that I really did a lot of intensive research there because I was kindly invited to uh, go somewhere else in Russia uh, by uh, the FSB. Um, the, um, there is, with the economic situation deteriorating, 
and um, with Gazprom giving less and less and less funding to corporate, to, to, to social initiatives, there is criticism arising, but it's still very remarkable that this neoliberal mentality of we need to build infrastructure, we need to build, we need to be connected to the world, something that was completely absent during the 1990s had materialized. So uh, that's definitely something um, that I want to look at, look, look to more in the future. Um, to that resistance, there are people that are critical to it, but there is just a general trust that everything's going to be okay because they gave us our princess back. So that's something that I hear quite a lot, and that's basically if you control symbolic capital, it's, it's, it gives you a lot of power. You also have to take into account that a lot of the an important sector and, and, and um, basically everybody. In, in, in the Alta Republic, because indigenous people in, in Russia find that so important, have higher education. And uh, the local university really, really runs on this consultancy work that they do for, for Gazprom. So the, the positive, the, the youngsters and the students at, 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 um, at the university are constantly reminded of the great things that are happening. The first time that I went to Alta in 2009, Everything really looked like, okay, Stalin built this, and then never, ne nothing happened anymore. And now all of a sudden, the university has a swimming pool, has the, they're sending their rafting team to the Olympics, etc., etc. Et so they're just a very, you know, I think sometimes corporations are, very, are, are better at influencing people through their PR mechanisms than states are, because they can really use a lot of uh, medium and a lot of communication uh, discourse. Right. I, I have Lee, Federica, and Jesse. So, if anybody else wants to be on the list, just give me a second, Lee. Yeah. Um, I thought what was uh, most interesting about this paper is um, how authoritarian uh, regimes will also use uh, carrots more than sticks. I mean, I go. You know, I remember back in the, in the seventies. Exxon Mobil was sponsoring Masterpiece Theater. Well, why are they doing this? You know, well, we then see this great, you know, gee, they're, they really care about culture and they really want us, you know, they're investing in public television and so on and so forth. So it's not unusual for uh, firms to invest in culture and sway the minds of, of people. But it, there could be a specific reason why energy companies do this, it seems. Uh, more than others, perhaps. And they're making these huge site-specific investments, uh, right? Capital investments in an area far away from Moscow. And they may well be uh, concerned about sabotage and uh, other issues. I'm just wondering if that could have come up, where if they could have put this thing in there if they wanted to, and not given the princess back. I mean, they can do whatever they want, presumably. Uh, but it would come with a lot of resistance uh, locally. And it seems that, you know, as a strategy, it's probably a lot cheaper to, to, to go this route. And again, if you, you know, I would be concerned if I'm making these investments um, of a huge capital outlay about uh, sabotage. Is that issue in the literature or come up at all? It's, it is very difficult to um, get an answer from, um, uh, to, to get inside the heads of uh, Gazprom and um, the regional ministry of, 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 of spatial planning and, and, and right. energy resources. Because as I write in my paper, I did an interview with the Minister of Resource Development in the Altai Republic and he said, there's never any person from Gazprom coming here. But then, at the same time, trucks of Gazprom are parked in front of the ministry, and then <laughs> they just ignore it. So that's very difficult. So I don't think necessarily it has to do with sabotage, because um, Altaians are not. It's not. It's not like Chechnya, or it's not like right. Tatarstan. Or, sabotage is too strong. Yeah. But I meant just th there's subtle ways of sabotaging yeah. things, so, of red tape, of just rather than yeah. you know blowing it up. Um, but so there was that. Maybe just another 
kind of slight follow-up that might get at this a little bit better, and it, it, it really follows on Jess's point, is do you have instances of Gazprom failing? I mean, where they did try the other approach, where we're just going to go in there and do this, and instead they flipped to this one? Is this relatively new? Uh, which, as you said, since the 90s, it's certainly new. But, so we learn a lot from failures as well as success. This seems like a success story from Gazprom's point of view. And from the locals' point of view, they, they seem to think it's a win. I think they learned a lot from the ecological protests from the 1980s and early 1990s That's in Siberia. Right. So in Alta, it was against a hydroelectric dam. All right. In the north, it was against oil and gas drilling. Um, and um, okay, everybody has its reasons why the Soviet Union fell. And one of the reasons that some, uh, I think, uh, Marjorie Balser from Georgetown uh, argues is, is that it was ecological protests uh, in the 1980s that were very important. And you really saw that uh, it, it developed, it generated collective agency. Uh, the, the protests, for example, in the 1990s, they were started under Brezhnev in the early 1980s, and they were really successful in stopping to build a massive hydroelectric dam. Uh, so um, um, there, I don't know any examples. Um, I'll, I'll be honest about it, and that's an excellent question, So, um, uh, and, and that's something that I need to investigate later is, um, examples of since the 2000s where projects by Gazprom have, 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 have been stopped. So I don't know of, of that, but um, I, I think they learned from um, um, a lot of people that are working in the ministries and, and that are behind Gazprom are the same people who endured the 1980s and the 1990s. And then a lot of ecological projects were stopped, energy plants, nuclear power plants uh, that were uh, planned to be built, they were really stopped by indigenous activism. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, they learned from, um, from, 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 from that. So I don't think that they necessarily do it uh, to stop sabotage, but I think yeah. they, first of all, the red tape is a good uh, question. You, I, I wrote that in, in, in a paper. They redefine the bureaucratic uh, right. uh, fabric of, 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 the, of the state, and then they move in. So they really have a well thought out they learn from past mistakes and they learn from other projects clearly and um, I, I agree uh, uh, um, uh, culture I always say that culture is the best investment that you can make uh, so uh, also for corporate corporations and for uh, it can help to strengthen fabric but it also can help to convince people so I think they they learn from past experiences and also when I was interviewing Gazprom engineers a lot of the people, and that's something that is really interesting to, to look at uh, uh, further in the future, is that a lot, some of these engineers were from Canada and the United States. So they hire in uh, expats. So I think corporates, corporate offices and PR mechanisms of consultancy companies in, in, in Europe, Norway, we're always looking to Norway and the Netherlands as extremely progressive countries, but uh, there's a, a, an enormous <laughs> private sector there and consultancy yeah. companies. So they probably... I'm sure that Gazprom gets help of that. They need to. Western technology is central in a lot of the the, the pipelines. I think uh, uh, Western and, and Russian strategies to co-opt indigenous people and, and a society is also central. Yes, thank you. So first, um, I'm going to say that, like, just uh, publicizing work that is being done in the workshop. So Jess Steinberg just wrote a book uh, that models and then tests the negotiations between local communities, uh, uh, extractive uh, industries, and the state. And and the police said my argument better. Fair enough. But just, 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 you know, just, just so that you know, uh, uh, productive conversations can continue to take place uh, at the workshop. Um, thank you so much. This was a, a really interesting paper. I was seven when they found OTSI, and uh, my um, elementary school teacher asked us to do research on the finding, which meant that I was terrified for about 12 years that Ozzy was in my parents' bedroom, <laughs> and I also am obsessed with um, ice um, mummies, so thank you so much. It was a fantastic paper, I enjoyed it very much. Question, um, can you say a little bit more about the bargaining situation, right? This comes partly by having read the uh, Jess's book, but it's in sort of like a, both questions, both Lee's and Jess's questions, are sort of like a pushing towards some sort of like a, a more uh, like a granular understanding of what is going on uh, as uh, 
uh, you know, like the, the decision is being made of creating the pipeline, Gazprom comes in, there is this epiphenomenal, like coincidental discovery of the mummy right then and there, which gives you some sort of like a, a focal point for like culture and uh, uh, cultural demands. But what else is going on in that particular situation? Like what are the possible demands that this new bargaining situation for the Altai community might generate? Um, and is like we're, we've been talking about success. I was reading the paper in a completely different way. This is this is a cheap compromise, right? Like Gazprom is going in and like giving them a museum, yeah. whatever. Right? That's, that's going to be much less expensive than giving like I don't know, creating like a, a, a larger basket of public goods uh, for a population that probably very much needs it, right? So. I wonder if there is a way of thinking about success versus failure by thinking more granularly about the bargaining situation and what is going on within the Altai case study, but also as, as Lee Paris was suggesting, like more broadly in Gazprom's uh, uh, sort of like a, a relationships with other communities. So um, I think the bargaining happens on the elite level, on the elite level, Altai elite. So. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my understanding of how the planning went because nothing has been made public and it's very difficult to get, uh, nobody wants to talk about it and during certain conversations, with, it's only through the scholars and the academics that I sometimes hear how everything went. I think it's very planned. Uh, it's planned, well thought out before, it's very strategized. And uh, basically what I heard in this case was that uh, it starts with academics, anthropologists and ethnologists from uh, the Russian Academy of Science that does uh, some kind of a study of, they kind of try to understand the, the, the situation. And uh, they, they don't necessarily move in, talk to, it's not like, for, I worked a while in Australia and there with the mining, you really see the company going into the community, doing really a clear assessment of everyday community members, uh, just normal community members, their needs and try to understand, no, that's that's all uh, being outsourced to academics, and then the, uh, what then happened in Altai was that they negotiated with key indigenous elites. So they talked to, um, I already thought that there was too much detail in the paper, I, uh, I'm also writing a book about this, so this is a summary of, of, of a book, but basically there's a lot of internal competition since the 1990s between different factions in the Altaian society, because Altaians and I'm not saying they don't like that, 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 that I'm not saying that, that I'm saying that, but they don't, historically they didn't exist. It's a creation by Stalin. So um, a lot of uh, uh, different indigenous groups were merged under one identity, state sanctioned identity, Altaian. And they all have different, the ones are Buddhists, there's a, a couple of them that are shamanist, then there's a couple of them that, uh, a couple of communities that are more Christian Orthodox, and they, 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 they're, since the 1990s, there's a very, very, very hard um, a discussion between the different groups on who's, who, who, has, who has the the, 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 uh, the power to decide what being an Altaian is. And um, the Buddhist group is now is, is in the capital, in, in, in Gordon Altaisk, and they are now in power. So we basically saw that, I, I basically saw that Gazprom has especially been negotiating with these elites. And all these initiatives have been basically been negotiated with these elites, and also with um, the, the ethnically Russian president that is now in power in the Altai Republic. And he, he needed political capital. So it's, it, the bargaining really happened on the top level, and it's very difficult to get that information. So, but um, basically what I, what the, 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 the impression is that, that I have it, it's very planned. So first they hire consultants, uh, it's people from the Academy of Science, uh, they don't have any money, they, they, there's very little funding these days in the, for the humanities research. Uh, so um, I saw pictures of uh, academics uh, doing, uh, uh, together with Gazprom, flying around in fancy helicopters, then one of those helicopters accidentally crashed down and there was a big scandal about that. Uh, but. Um, they do a lot of, um, they don't even do very good anthropology, to my impression, but they do very, a lot of very short visits, and they make, I think, it's, it feels like they're making them some kind of a master plan, like, indeed, we can, what is the cheapest solution that we can have for here? And um, of those pictures that I was shared, that, that some of my colleagues shared to me, 
I could see, for example, so the Altai nation consists of different tribes, and every tribe is uh, headed by a Zai Sam, it's a, 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 a tribal uh, head. And on a couple of these pictures, I saw uh, some Zai Sam uh, next to play, playing Altai and folk music next to a, a helicopter of, of Gazprom. So they were basically being the Bart bartered, but not bartered as in what does the community <coughs> need, but uh, uh, yeah. jeeps were being given. So it reminds me very much of, of, of the, 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 the work of uh, uh, the anthropologists that have been working in Papua and Indonesia, is that basically the, the, uh, it's a negotiation between the, the top of, 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 of uh, the, the, the tri uh, tribal group and, and the company, and that's very dense. But it's good to know that it, that, that book exists. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hi. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, and my question is sort of similar to what Lee and Jess uh, were talking about. Um, but I want to ask about the archaeologists. I found it really interesting that benign archaeological institutes and departments are being turned transformed into political powerhouses. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so. My overarching question, and then I'll have a specific part to it, is sort of what is not a tactic? What is not a strategy? Where's the mess? Where, where are things getting bungled up? And then specifically uh, related to the archeologists, um, what happens in these cases when there is friction between the archeologists and the corporation or the state? Um, how does that ne get negotiated? I mean, is it negotiated at the point of once the contract is signed, then there's just sort of an agreement to have an agreement, um, or or where do they sort of uh, when when the when the knowledge or the findings rubs up against the corp interest of the corporation, how do they how do they solve that? Great question. Um, um, so um, first of all, um, the thing that I um, Read in your uh, 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 between the li understand between the lines of, of your comment is that, um, and this paper has maybe a shortcoming of, of many anthropologists these days is that uh, we are uh, kind of obsessed with finding the strategy. So mm -hmm. I don't think that everything is strategy. I think um, there's a lot of decisions that are just being made because they're being made because of the context, and um, that's I think a, a big threat of the future <coughs> of anthropology is that uh, so at, at some times. A lot of anthropologists, especially now with the whole obsession with bureaucracy and infrastructures, is that we, we're kind of getting a, get, we're falling into the traps of structuralism again. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, to, for your specifically to, to, to relate back to, to your question, is that is there friction between the archaeologists and the corporations? Um, uh, yes, um, a lot of the of the so um, on the course of this pipeline, there has been already a survey being done. That, so they're making an estimate of how much it's going to cost to excavate all these burial mounds and more mummies that are going to be found along the line of this pipeline. And I think they, they came up with something like 300 burial mounds, which is an enormous, one burial mound can take up to a year to excavate. So again, there's some practical reality there because we always look to cultural heritage as symbolic capital. It's also sometimes an annoyance because it slows construction. And I think that's is for a lot of companies, cultural heritage is not first and foremost a corporate social responsibility too, it's an annoyance. Um, so, um, but um, what I found very remarkable, my, my colleagues that, that work uh, there at the, the Academy of Science and also the local university of Cornwall Altaisk, a very small archeological unit that only has two or three archeologists uh, with whom I published about this, or these horrible things, they also gone up to the excavation because they were finally going to get some money. And they also said, like, this is never going to work. We're never going to be able to excavate a anything. And they really pushed against Gazprom. And Gazprom didn't want to pay for, I think, it's going to be something like four, five, six million euros that this excavation is going to cost, which is a lot in, 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 in Siberia. Um, and um, they were really annoyed, and they really and Gazprom didn't want to pay a lot. They really wanted to have it go fast and cheap, um, and they really were able to negotiate with with, with Gazprom uh, for uh, more money. For but yeah, but this more money, of course, comes in 
in support for the pipeline because, for example, Vyacheslav Morodin, uh, the guy that won the prize and the guy that is also in charge of surveying and, and, and doing the, he's head of the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology of Novosibirsk. So he's also in charge of the anthropological uh, uh, consultancy work that has been done through a whole series of small companies, spin-offs from the university um, and at the institute. Um, so um, they really push back, but at the same time, they're returning the favor. Uh, and it is my impression that um, uh, the, in order to head one of those institutes in the Russian Academy of Science, you need to be an academician. It's like some kind of a very fancy title. And a lot of these people that are at the top of these institutes have historically been also very... In, in the Soviet Union, they, all, they usually had, had, had a, a party, uh, they were key members of the party, and you kind of feel that the people that are in charge of these powerhouses, they have a lot of political uh, links. Uh, a lot of these people now, for example, of, are now excavating in Palmyra or excavating in Crimea. So you clearly see that um, they're part of the establishment, more or less. And the resistance really happens uh, in the local universities, but also the members of the teams. And they were really complaining, like, um, on the one hand, we really want to excavate this because we were not able to excavate this very long, for a long time. Uh, but And we're also kind of happy that we now finally have money. <coughs> because um, it is true. Um, for example, Novosibirsk uh, Archaeological Institute, they have a C14 lab that's about like nuclear physics and stuff like that. That's even in Flanders or in the Netherlands, <coughs> we send everything to Germany because we don't. It costs so much money. So these institutes are really powerful. They produce also, purely objectively speaking, from an academic perspective, it is partially, it is kind of sometimes unethical, but they also produce really good research. So it's this. Uh, this, this idea of producing positivist idea of, of, of idea of producing very good research, so uh, a lot of the, my, the, the people that, that do the excavations they're torn a bit, like being able to continue to excavate, but at the same time um, they also acknowledge that this is going to be not the best thing happening. So the only benefit uh, uh, of the situation that we have now is that uh, 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 Russia and China can't seem to agree on. The price so the pipeline has not been built yet but you see even when a pipeline is not being built um, from that from 2005 onwards the whole the whole system the whole society has been redefined hi i'm barb nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Uh, i enjoy your paper um <clears throat> one thing that um i would suggest for further development is to deal more directly with the structure of Gazprom itself, and particularly its evolution over time. Because when, that's not really discussed in the paper, so to just inform myself about it, for example, if I just check Wikipedia, um, it's really interesting to look at the evolution of the of Gazprom itself from being a government monopoly to being partially privatized, but was still down in government share, and then how we went through periods of asset stripping and tax evasion, and that was only changed after Putin comes in, uh, gets rid of some of the oligarchs, it actually puts in new people, including Medvedev, and um, starts pressing them more to stop this behavior, which means now they have to refocus their energies and how they're going to go about. So there's actually some significant dynamics in the evolution of Gazprom itself, which may be inducing it to find different strategies because its old ones were being blocked by the government. Yeah. So it's that part I didn't know or wouldn't know from reading this paper. So maybe it's implied or you know it, but what I'm saying is the reader doesn't necessarily. So it begs the question. So for me, I found that Recounting some of this organizational history might help also further develop the narrative or the framing of how this organization then turns to these different strategies. And the state actually had a very important role in making that happen. Yeah, yeah you, I, I completely agree, and thank you uh, okay. uh, for, 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 for your comment. That, 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 that is something that I am exploring further. Um, it is difficult to really find a lot of 
uh, information on Gazprom alone because it gets very messy in the 2000s and uh, the 1990s. Um, but um, it is uh, truly uh, interesting and it's also uh, worthwhile uh, looking into, for example, the Panama Papers that have been released now because there we kind of begin to see that uh, a lot of the private assets of uh, Putin and his nomenclatura is involved in ownership of, of, the, of, of, of the shares. Um, so that's why it's difficult. Some people call Gazprom uh, an, uh, uh, a an government-owned uh, company, but it is more complex than that. They are being traded on the international stock market, uh, and uh, the profit, uh, that's maybe for me that feels like the biggest difference with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the work uh, by Douglas Rogers on uh, on oil barter during the Soviet Union, in that uh, this um, uh, tapping into the global market is now much more important. So it is true the structure is very messy. There's one good paper that that really details how it is it, it, it evolves, but it needs uh, further work. But it, it is difficult to, to get to know into the details. Well, the reason I also offer this as an observation in my area is telecommunications companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I mentioned looking at the evolution of the forms is that what we found was, for example, in the latter part of the 20th century, the last quarter in particular, as many governments were privatizing their telecommunications networks, some wholly, some only in part, um, that also affected in large part how these organizations behaved and how they approached what strategies they adapted. So the evolution of the entity from that side of the fence itself can have a significant factor in the interplay of how it chooses to further its performance, business, and, and infrastructure. And again, with energy companies having these big infrastructure they need to build, there's another parallel of telecom. So um, the evolution of the organizational form itself is a very important variable, I would suggest. And sometimes these major changes can be viewed as a form of tr phase transition. Organizations themselves go through phase transitions. Yep. And they go from being wholly government owned to partially privatized and fully privatized. And these are very significant changes and it affects a lot their own strategies and organizational structures and behavior. So it was just, you know, having seen this parallel in telecom and now seeing this, I just thought that might be, you know, an insight or way of looking at that might further um, generate some ideas. Yeah, that's excellent. And, uh, thank you very much for that. I do also think that the organizational culture changed a lot, um, and within the privatization, the deprivatization, um, they didn't get rid of everybody. And uh, again, what I—that's something that I want to focus more on in, in the future—is uh, also how these Western companies all of a sudden, and consultancy companies, got inserted in, into that. So, I want to ask you about, because um, I, I don't have anyone else on the list. I have a question um, a little bit more generally about ethno-federal states, right? Mm -hmm. So, there, it's, it's sort of two parts. One is that you're looking in 2009 to 2015 in a period where Russia is you know, experiencing this incredible down economic downturn. And so it is interesting that they make the decision to go more in a cultural direction than in a, sort of providing sort of a social safety net, like, like, they, like oil companies or energy companies have in Kazakhstan, right? And it, but also, it's a problem, it's a moment when the regime has turned, as, as you know from the way I write about it, but you're in dialogue with what the regime is turning to have a more nationalist or reshape the nationalist narrative. And it has a problem because it has these geographically defined ethnic states where that top down imposition of the narrative isn't going down so well, where it's creating friction. And so I wondered if, if you saw any sign of sort of using these cultural indigenous groups to offset the narrative coming from Moscow and whether the support that was being given to Gazprom for in the picture, the protest, the sign that says 
we support Gazprom, if that's transferred to the central government or not, or how that's moving around in terms of support. So I've also written a little bit on, on, um, um, on Tatarstan, how the Shaimiyev government right. is, is, is handling that, and um, I think uh, Altai and, Sh and, and um, Tatarstan, right, it's first of all very important to notice, and not a lot of people know that, that 20% of the Russian inhabitants are ethnically non-Russian. So everybody always look to, looks to Russia as this Slavic, enormous country, but actually um, I think that's more than 20 million people that are, are not are non ethnically non-Russian that have a certain status. Um, so um, and the parallels that I see with um, with Tatarstan is that Altai is this zone of exception um, where this cultural war doesn't seem to be waged that strong. So um, in a way. The national, the, 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 the great uh, patriotic war, of course, narratives that, that, that because that unites everybody, that, that, that still happens there. But what I see in, in my research is that um, until 2010, roughly, um, there's a lot of the structural discrimination versus the Altaians. So that fits really well into this creation of a strong Russian meta narrative, everybody united under the same flag, and under the same symbols. And in the beginning, I really saw that. A lot of people were trying to put Altaian, being Altaian in this whole Russian big narrative. Even, uh, I shortly uh, uh, I quoted that, but that's something that I, I did is a paper on its own. Is um, when they did DNA research on this mummy, they discovered that she was European. So it's a little bit like Kennewick Man in the United States. Like, uh, no, 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 the Europeans were here before in this country, in this mm -hmm. continent. So um, uh, we kind of see that that was being used in a, in a certain way of, of depicting Altai as, as part of the Russian heartland. But what I found remarkable is that when really the paperwork got signed to construct this pipeline, all of a sudden this whole crafting and carefully creating of a Russian identity using uh, giving access, uh, depriving indigenous uh, groups of access to cultural capital, all of a sudden, oh no, we need to construct a pipeline. Let's drop everything and they can have like the museum really celebrates Altaian culture while and before I, I noticed that uh, if they were stressing their language rights too much uh, they would be called extremists fascists the indigenous groups and in this museum you all of a sudden see this narrative of like a big uh, nation that has historically existed so that seems to be a little bit and there's a certain friction with what the literature sometimes says about, and indeed I agree completely with you, hey, the collapse of the, um, uh, of the oil, oil prices has forced the Kremlin to adopt new strategies. And I see that, for example, how the Great Patriotic War is being used. It's really being used to craft uh, a, a Russian, you know, Ruski and, and uh, Rossiski are, being, are, are collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, ethnically Russian and Feder Russian Federation are, 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 are becoming synonyms. But what is remarkable in this example is that when pipelines need to be built, well, okay, then some people can get exceptions. And it's the same with Shaimiev and Tatarstan because Tatarstan is so important for access to the Middle East and also for resource extraction. But over there, the Tatars are allowed, for example, to the first page of their passport is still an inhabitant of the Republic of Tatarstan. It's not Russian Federation. So there seems to be okay, we have this very rigid cultural policy, but we're glad to make exceptions if it gives a certain benefit. And that's what I find remarkable uh, uh, compared to other case studies and other examples of indigenous politics. For example, the work of Marjorie Balzer clearly shows that I think it's on the Ivanki that she works, that the Ivanki don't get these benefits or even the, the lobs uh, in around Murmansk. Uh, if they want to build a gas, a gas plant there, it's going to be built there, and they're going to be deprived of certain regimes. So it's, it's interesting. So culture is neat and important, but it's also, um, it, yeah, it's, it can also they, can, they also make exceptions to this very, very strong narrative. Yeah, just, you know, I've been staring at this map, and um, the interesting thing is, you know, it's, it's all in Russia except for this new juncture that's going into China. 
So right now it's a pipeline that's going nowhere. Well, it's going... Um, well, that's where they want it to go, right? Yeah. And Urumqi is here, Xinyong, and this is really... But the question is, what's holding it up? And is it the Chinese who are playing hardball because they know that, you know, it looks like Gazprom's invested a lot, which makes China a much stronger player in negotiating whether or not it eventually goes through. Yeah. I mean, it seems like Gazprom was maybe premature it, um, unless they, you know, had everything in place. Because now the Chinese can hold them up. Uh, is that what's happening? Or? It is interesting. Um, so I've worked in, on the Chinese side of the Altai Mountains too, yeah. and there uh, the highway and everything is ready for the pipeline, but they're waiting to negotiate the price. And that's now the only reason that is holding back the construction of the pipeline, because um, first of all, they don't know if they're going to have enough gas to pump into the pipeline. Mm. And secondly, uh, because um, uh, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, yeah. I, I, I could be wrong about the last country, they're also pumping gas into China cheaper. Uh. So they're, they're, they're the only, indeed, I think Gazprom was a little bit pre premature uh, in uh, negotiating that. But yeah, the, the only real thing that is holding their back, administration-wise, it's okay, red tape, it's okay, social support is okay, but the only thing that is now holding their back is that this 40-kilometer border zone, it's only 40 kilometer, is World Heritage and a list and World Heritage list by UNESCO. Uh, 40 kilometers. Yeah. And so uh, that's also interesting to look what the UNESCO is doing now. They created a 100 meter wide recreational zone cutting through the. <laughs> Uh, the World Heritage sites, and they say it's to build campsites. But it's very strange. It's very beautifully linear, and it, uh, yeah, it's probably the Bible. So it's also interesting to look how UNESCO is being uh, taken over in, 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 in a way. But here, I don't think it's going to be built. But the damage to the cultural fabric and the social fabric has been done. Right. Okay, so I want to say that 10 years, almost 10 year ago, years ago exactly, around this time I gave my first talk at the workshop and Vincent was sitting back there and it was about Russian federalism and he said, how do you know there's a Russia? And I just couldn't understand the question. <laughs> but the question was exactly this question. And uh, having, being asked that question today, I would understand the question. And so that is the role of the Ostrom work in the evolution of my thinking is to, is to re-problematize that. How do we know there's a Russia question? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here.